Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world, and welcome to the first of our discussions on how we can unleash the new global university. Over this series, we will discuss issues such as international collaborations and how we can shift the focus towards Africa, undergraduate student mobility, and the postgraduate international experience. And I hope you can join us for all of them. This first event focuses on conferences, workshops, and other academic get-togethers. And we are asking the question, how virtual can we go? Of course, we are virtual right now and holding an international conversation at virtually no cost. It is one of the few effects of the pandemic that I think we can be thankful for. This is why we want to discuss how we can reap the full benefits that virtual life can offer. The events of this nature of this year are exposing and exacerbating humanities inequalities of race, class and gender in a way that is difficult to ignore. This is a good thing as much as it's uncomfortable. It's a good thing as it calls on us to address these inequalities with more urgency than ever before. There is also much talk about how this moment of crisis might lead to opportunities to reshape the world. And those of us who can make an impact in leadership positions, in education, as opinion makers, as influencers, need to do what we can to ensure that the moment does not pass and that we do not simply sink back to the old normal. We must always remember that the old normal was never perfect. So as much as we want things to go back to normal, it should never be a desire for the old normal. Seizing the opportunity or the moment and initiating change demands that we challenge the comfort of privilege and habitual ways of being, of seeing, of knowing and doing. And that is by definition uncomfortable. We need to lean into our discomfort disrupt ourselves and lead the changes that we want to see. And that is what we are attempting to do in this series of challenging conversations. Internationalization has become critical to the work that we do as research intensive universities. The research we do, the income we earn, the cultures on our campuses and the ways in which we are measured. It is in a sense built into the DNA of research universities. Then COVID-19 hit us and boom, almost overnight, the international activities just stopped. We canceled or postponed conferences. Our students did not arrive or went home and we stayed put. And as with other problems in the world, lockdown forced us to address the problems of internationalization that we were already aware of. We knew that our travel was unsustainable, costly to institutions, and more importantly, costly to the planet. We knew that these international activities that had become so essential to the academic career were not possible for everyone in equal measure. The more important, more importantly, or the more important issue became how to participate in and network at international conferences the more those who could not afford to do so have been left behind. So we encourage them to participate in international conferences. We measure their success in that way. But those who cannot afford were left behind. We knew that international travel was a barrier to primary caregivers, mostly women. And so it increased gender inequality. At the same time, we knew that International collaboration was essential to develop the core missions of universities. And COVID-19 has demonstrated that we need to work together as never before. Technology has leapt admirably into the breach. We have had great stories of virtual conferences, and I hope we hear some of them in the next hour. But we are asking, how virtual can we go? What is gained? and what is lost when we go virtual? And are we replacing one inequality with another inequality in the form of digital inequality? I invite you to help us reimagine these international spaces for a sustainable, equitable planet 
and for closer collaboration between universities. Let me say thank you to our panelists for accepting our invitation this afternoon, this evening, this morning, wherever you are. More importantly, thank you to our moderator for the first event, who I'm very delighted to introduce, Professor Kelly Chibale. Kelly is a professor of organic chemistry here at UCT and founder and director of H3D, Africa's first integrated drug discovery and development center. Kelly will introduce you to our speakers. I'm very excited to have such brilliant speakers and I thank all of them for giving up their time to help us think through the future of international conferences. I look forward to some challenging conversations starting today. Over to you, Kelly. Thank you, Vice Chancellor, for um, that very warm introduction and welcome to, to, uh, to everybody attending this uh, session. Um, I'm incredibly honored to be moderating this uh, panel of um, wonderful, wonderful speakers, as you will find out. When the Vice Chancellor began to speak, um, she posed a question regarding the future of conferences. How virtual can we go? I'm going to add two more questions. How virtual do we need to go? How virtual do we want to go? And as the Vice Chancellor was uh, also summarizing, what are the losses of virtual conferences, workshops, scientific meetings? How can we reinvent conferences? Those are really, really important questions. Um, that I'm looking forward to our panelists who I'm about to introduce will, will answer. The first uh, of our panelists uh, is um, uh, Phil Betty from the Times Higher Education. And he will be involved in a conversation with uh, Isabel Casimiro from um, uh, Edward uh, Modland University in, in Mozambique. Uh, who is uh, Phil and Isabel represent uh, panelists who um, have experience of running large organizations and can really um, give us the, uh, the benefit of having that experience and the impact of going virtual around conferences. So that's Phil Betty and Isabel uh, Casimero. It's my real pleasure to kick off the conversation with the first question, which I'm going to direct to Phil Betty um, to really get us started um, in addressing this question of uh, virtual conferences. Phil, in your opinion, is it the need for sustainability, which the Vice Chancellor was referring to in our introduction, or is it the need to address inequalities, or is it COVID-19 that has really made it essential or legitimize virtual conferences. Phil, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Kelly. Thank you all for, for having me at this important event. I do think this is a, a wonderful opportunity to reevaluate the academic conference and, and really work hard to make sure these conferences are more equal, more sustainable. So Times Higher Education runs the World Academic Summit and the World uh, Summit series all over the world. And we have been a very traditional model, face-to-face uh, -face events, senior leaders from uh, universities across the world meeting in a big city somewhere several times a year, We've tried to be inclusive in terms of where we have our events. We've held them in all continents. We've been in Accra and Ghana. We've been in Johannesburg several times. We've been in Abuja. But actually, they're still constrained by the physical realities of buying a ticket, getting on an airplane in many cases, getting your hotel booked. Um, and we were increasingly under pressure to rethink how accessible the events were in terms of equality, but also how accessible they were in terms of reducing individuals' carbon footprints and reducing the overall carbon footprint of an event. So before COVID-19 hit, we were starting to think about hybrid models, introducing more digital access to events, but still around a face-to-face -face model. Um, but actually the coronavirus came along, literally wiped out our entire series. Um, I'd been to 
uh, two or three countries in January, February. I've been grounded since we've cancelled the entire series of events for 2020, but we've moved online. And I think what's happened when we've moved online, we've we've learned so many lessons. The first one, of course, is that we have a great audience and an audience that still wants to engage. I think it's vital to really, really protect the international exchange of ideas, the international collaborations that are the lifeblood of global higher education. We have to work so hard as politicians become more nationalist, as borders close, that we still reach out across borders, across countries to share ideas, to exchange knowledge. That's vital so that we have to protect that. But the hunger and appetite to protect that was so, so strong. And what we found actually is by going virtual, we've dramatically increased the engagement that we have. Um, we'd normally have maybe between 200 and 400 uh, senior leaders at our events uh, every time. And we've conducted seven events virtually since March, and we've engaged 6,000 people um, from more than 100 countries. So I think coronavirus has forced us to go virtual, but it's taught us two vital lessons. One is we need to keep connecting and we need to find better ways to do it. Uh, we need to overcome traditional barriers um, for, for, for access to these events, with whether it's financial, whether it's uh, the, the immigration regimes of countries, often incredibly hostile, incredibly uh, cumbersome immigration regimes. And the second one, of course, is that um, we can reach out far, far more broadly and more widely now as a result of um, going virtual. Uh, so back to you, Kelly. Thank you, Phil. Thank you very much indeed. So. Um, my next question will be to, uh, to Isabel. Um, I think you, we heard very clearly um, what Phil was articulating about the importance of really maintaining uh, these connections that, that we, we have. Um, that in fact, these are really the lifeblood of, of, of higher education, as, as Phil put it. Um, and of course, we also heard from Phil um, how the experience from the virtual conferences that I've had and the success that there has been um, could provide a basis uh, or justification for going completely virtual, uh, which of course um, is, is something that we have to keep in mind completely. But to the question that I really want to pose to you, Isabel, um, if we were to completely go virtual with conferences and we did away with any form of face-to-face -face meetings, in other words, we go to the extreme of just going 100% virtual. What do you think um, are the the things that we are going to lose that we cannot afford to lose if we went 100%? Which means that we have to then moderate uh, in order to maintain the things that we, we cannot afford to lose. Isabel, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to, to thank you all the Vice Chancellor and uh, everybody from the University of Cape Town for inviting me to participate in this uh, virtual conference, we can say, conversation. Um, yeah. Before and after Corona, we, we really had many problems organizing conferences. We have a lot of problems. As was said before, we have problems because of borders, we have problems because of visas, we have a lot of problems, it is true. But you now there are things that the, the virtual conference has to address. And I'm, I'm talking uh, Thinking about Mozambique, we need to have good internet and good access to internet. For us, it is a big, big challenge. Before coming for this meeting, we had a, a meeting with researchers from the Center of African Studies where I'm working. I am a teacher and a researcher there. Everybody in Maputo. And sometimes we could not uh, here, each one of us. It was not easy. And yeah, we have a, a colleague in Germany. We could hear him better than some of us here, you know. So this is something that we need to have. And another thing, 
And again, I'm talking, thinking about Mozambique. People need to have good cell phones or desktops or laptops. Our university has not this capacity for everybody. The other thing is that internet is very expensive. And sometimes our students or colleagues, even colleagues, uh, are with us, but then the internet goes down, you know? So it's not, it's not very, very, very easy. And there are, again, other challenges, but uh, for me, these are the main challenges that we face. And you now to finish, I have to confess that I, 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 I was socialized with the, the face to face, being together with people, and I miss this very much. I have to confess that. I know that we are doing a lot of things that we did before. I participated in lots of defenses, PhD and master defenses with Brazil and so on. So we have been doing that, but you know, the face to face, the knowing of other cultures, the knowing of other smells of other people is also very important. And I hope that we will not finish with this type of contact, you know, because at the same time, as, as the vice chancellor said, there are also challenges and inequalities in this new old world that we have to, to embrace. Thank you, Kanima. Thank you so much, um, um, Isabel. Um, I'm going to switch back to Phil um, um, in a moment. Um, so Phil, when, when we started talking um, earlier, when we, you began talking about the, um, the virtual conferences that Tams Higher Education has had, um, um, you, of course, you know, also actually the Vice Chancellor in the introduction uh, was referring to the question of um, inequalities, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the question I'm going to ask you is really in two parts, uh, and I think I'll, I'll go with one part at a time. Uh, I'm going to ask you about the, the, the question around how these virtual conferences uh, could potentially help us address inequalities that the Vice Chancellor was referring to in the introduction and also what Isabel also touched on, uh, including, for example, you know, issues of access to the internet, um, but also to think about some of the other um, sort of unacceptable practices that were quite evident uh, uh, during normal face-to-face -face meetings, you know, which could range from anything that people didn't find approval of uh, when we were having uh, these face-to-face -face conferences. So that's one part of the question, um, but I'll come back to the second part of the question around sustainability, financial sustainability, um, uh, even with a virtual model. Um, but let's deal with the, the first part of the question, uh, which is really that if the virtual conferences are the way to go, how will this help us address inequalities and help us stamp out unacceptable practices that uh, were a feature of some of the face-to-face -face meetings? Phil, over to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's a lot to get your teeth into there. I mean, I think one of the things that is clear to Times Higher Education is there is still a real hunger for face to face. We will still, as soon as coronavirus allows us, we will return to face to face. We think people are very, very keen to come and meet in that sort of social space and, 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 and have the the intimacy of a face to face environment that has a lot of uh, qualities there. You know, I think 60 percent of fellows of the the Royal Academy and the, 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 the Royal Society, the British Academy had said that they've collaborated specifically based on people they've met at conferences. So that's very important, those serendipitous encounters, those chance meetings. But I think what we've seen in the UK in particular is, um, and, in the, and the US actually, is some extraordinary cases of unacceptable behaviour at conferences when it comes to the inequalities of the, hier the, the internal hierarchies in academia. You know, there's often a case of um, patronage being playing a very heavy role. People who are in a senior position, uh, more junior people, more vulnerable people seeking out and trying to find and, and build a relationship with more senior people. We've seen, um, you know, unacceptable practices. I, I actually tweeted in 20. 
2019 and uh, what is the most terrible behavior you've experienced at an academic conference and I thought I would get examples of maybe arrogance or complacency or people asking uh, this, this you know asking a, t a question that's too long all these silly things and actually what we got as a flood an outpouring of cases of sexual harassment, sexual uh, inappropriate conduct. And that's because, you know, a mixture of patronage, a mixture of inequalities, a mixture of the sort of um, often alcohol fueled social situations meant really inappropriate structural problems. So I think actually a digital event can rule a lot of that out in terms of creating a level playing field, taking away those sort of social interactions, those, you know, even interviews in hotel suites or interviews or job career conversations at a bar and over drinks. You know, you can take all those situations away, but we need, I think, technology to recreate the intimacy of personal connections and the ability to catch somebody one to one. And I think the platform that we're using actually at Times Higher Education from this month onwards will allow these profile building uh, pages, the ability to invite people to talk to you on a one on one basis. But of course, without all of that um, context, which can breed uh, inappropriate behavior. So I'm very excited that there's that kind of leveling of the playing field in terms of equality. And the other side, of course, briefly is reducing the cost dramatically um, is helpful in terms of inclusion. But in particular, overcoming some of these terrible uh, immigration hurdles that a lot of countries place. You know, we've had the African Studies Conference at the University of Cambridge. 14 African scholars were turned away. This was a few years ago. 14 African scholars could not get a visa for the African Studies uh, Conference in the UK. It's not acceptable. And although we need to fight against these crazy immigration policies, which of course we do in higher education, this is at least a way of overcoming those barriers when they exist. So, sorry, back to you, Kelly. Thank you, Phil. And just very briefly, what about uh, financial sustainability? Obviously, virtual conferences are, are free. Are they going to remain free forever? Well, we've got a very good model where we've left all of our events free to attend, which is great for engagement, um, but we have uh, brought in some sponsors. So we've got sponsorship. So that's often a model that really helps. Obviously, we have to invest a lot of time and energy in, in building the content and developing the program. So that's been a good model. We have actually decided to charge a modest fee for the World Academic Summit. I'm delighted we have outstanding speakers in September, including, of course, the president of UCT, uh, Kathy Pateng. Um, but we are going to charge a very modest fee around 200 pounds, but we will be allowing bursaries. We'll be allowing people to get in touch with us um, to make allowances. So we're not really using that as a, a, a revenue driver. It's just a way of obviously meeting some of the costs involved in putting the event on, but much, much, much lower price point and without any of the associated costs of travel and accommodation and et cetera, et cetera. So much more accessible. But yeah, there is an issue around how do you uh, create a financial model that's sustainable, but sponsorship and maybe modest host fees are, are the way we've gone this year. Thank you so much, Phil. So uh, I guess before we get to the uh, Q&A, I have uh, one question I'd like to throw to Isabel um, uh, that will conclude this um, uh, chat before we get to the Q&A. Um, Isabel, you're based in Mozambique, uh, and I know that you are fluent in many languages. Uh, you can speak Portuguese, and of course you can speak English. That's why we can understand you, or at least I can understand you. Um, now, of course, potentially, if we were to go virtual, even in some form or shape, um, there's going to be challenges with language, uh, language barriers. Um, so from a language perspective, um, what do you see as some of the potential challenges uh, and barriers to people, depending on the language that they speak and, and where they come from, if we went virtual completely? Thank you again. Yes, this is a big challenge. Look, for example, Kodesia. Kodesria, it is the Council for Social Sciences and for Research in Social Sciences in Africa. According to, to our uh, status, um, Kodesria has four languages trying to cover the continent. And we are talking about official languages, you know, English, French, Arabic and Portuguese. But because of the costs, when we have our meetings, we only have translation to French and English. And this causes problems to some of us. 
we need to speak in these languages. And this is in the continent. If we, if we look to conferences that are in English, some people cannot participate, the, the virtual conferences, if there is no simultaneous translation. And there is another problem. It is the language of sign. We say it's sign, sign languages, isn't it? So for me, this, this is really a big challenge. We can go virtual or face to face, but there are always these type of problems. You know, we, we, we have these problems every day when we, we tell our students, look, you have these books or these articles in English. And although we have to study English in the university, you know, or Swahili, there is always a problem for them, you know, so it is a challenge. It is a challenge for us, not for me, okay, because I can speak some of these languages, but for the small community, okay, it is a small community that speaks only Portuguese, it is a challenge. And there are people that can only speak the national uh, languages. You have lots of national languages. We also have almost 30 and not everybody can speak. So, you know, there, there are always a lot of, of challenges regarding language. Back to you, Candy. Thank you very much, uh, Isabel and, and Phil. Um, uh, that's been a very, very interesting, fascinating uh, conversation. Um, we're going to move to the uh, next part of uh, this, which is um, to put you, Phil, and Isabel in the hot seat um, to um, answer some burning questions. There have been a flood of questions that came through, um, and of course, uh, they speak to some of the issues that you've already addressed, and others I think people would want to, to elaborate on. So I'm going to ask uh, the first question that is, is specifically for Phil. Um, and then the second question will come to Isabel and then of course feel free to contribute. So I'm going to read this question, Phil, that is specifically for you. And the question is, is as follows. How do we overcome patronage in face-to-face -face conferences in the new global university? Perhaps breakaway rooms are a good way booking people's time, provided that they are not inherently biased against people. I hope that question is uh, clear to you, Phil. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously we've seen some horrendous examples. It's really brought to the forefront how many um, deep-seated prejudices we, we face as humanity. You know, we've seen the horrendous incidents uh, in Minnesota, in the US, there's clearly a problem with racism, clearly a problem with prejudice. And I think there is a sense that these digital events can really help overcome some of that. And, and I'm really looking forward to listening later to, to Esther and, and Katie on, on this issue around, you know, gender bias is prevalent, race, race discrimination is prevalent. So hopefully a digital event can actually tr help anonymize or help protect people and, and focus on the scholarship and ideas, not the, the accent in the face. And I'll, and I'll obviously leave Esther and Katie to talk more about that because I know they have plenty to say there. Face to face, I think there's a huge issue around confronting and challenging um, prejudice in human beings. We've got a huge amount of work to do as a as a community to um, address, obviously conscious bias is a, a hideous, uh, a front to, to the world, but unconscious bias sits there as well. People tend to seek out um, people with similar interests, similar social lives, similar um, cultural backgrounds. So we need to really stamp that out and find ways to make the work itself and the ideas speak for themselves. And I think you're right, there's in, in peer review processes, there's, there's a, an element of anonymity involved, which is important, and assessment, there's, there's all sorts of processes of anonymizing things. But my sense is maybe really clear rules around um, not having all the work done in a social setting. It's a classic sort of office thing, you know, if you're interested in soccer 
and you take you know you go out as a group to a, a soccer match and maybe that's excluded certain people who aren't interested in soccer then there's important things to structure these meetings properly organize them properly so you know the idea in some of these uh, big us uh, events meetings in bedrooms meetings in um you know in a crowded bar with with alcohol flowing you know really try and clamp out those those practices and and put some real structure in place. I know that's not the answer itself, but I think it goes some way to at least remove as many of these um, problems as possible. Thank you, Phil. Um, I will come back later with a couple of questions for you, but I'm going to switch uh, now to to Isabel. I think one of the things that you highlighted, uh, Isabel, in your um, uh, discussion was, of course, you gave the example of your own country. Um, uh, around um, access to, to, to the internet and the inequalities around access to, to the internet. So there is a specific question um, around this digital divide. And, and I wonder whether you can entertain some, some, some answers and possible solutions. Uh, and the question is really as follows. How are we going to ensure access uh, to computers, data, and Wi-Fi, effective connectivity. Um, so for your country of Mozambique, for example, you know, how do you think we're going to address this digital divide of poor access to the internet and these connectivity issues? Any thoughts? We have been discussing this. You know, Eduard Mondial University is the oldest university, not as oldest as yours universities, we know. But it is the oldest one, and as I told you, we have problems. I, um, I had some PhD lessons with the students from a private university, and it was the same situation. Every day that we had lessons, two students could never enter the Zoom platform, and some of them were always uh, going out and with difficulties to, to go in again and with someone uh, in the back to, to help us. So it is really something that we are discussing and, you know, universities and the, the government must invest. If we, we, we say that our university and today we talked about this is a research university, how can we do that? without having a good internet connection. Because there are a lot of things that we need to, to see in the, in, the, in the internet. We need to go to different um, sites to study and we need to contact other people. So this is something that we think that the universities and the government must invest. Education is a very important issue. It is something that cannot uh, be put away. So the only the only way is to invest is to get support. And we know that there are uh, organizations that can support us, but we cannot go on the way we we are. We are. Um, unfortunately, just in the interest of time, I was really tempted. There's a flood of questions, and I'm sure that after this. Um, event, I think you're going to get a lot of emails, uh, Phil and, and Isabel, from, from the various people. Um, but I think because we're running out of time, I'm going to just um, draw this to a conclusion. Uh, very fascinating conversation and really want to thank Phil uh, and Isabel for um, just really getting involved in uh, and this um, first part of the conversation. Really appreciate your, your, your insights and, and thoughtfulness on this. Thank you so much indeed. Much appreciated.